Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which is organized by HESI's Environmental Epidemiology Committee. I'm Sandrine Deglin, and I'm a senior scientific program manager at HESI, and I manage the Environmental Epidemiology Committee. Uh, Mr. David Miller and um, Dr. Igor Borstein, who are two of our committee co-chairs, are also here with me today, and they will be moderating the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be presented by Professor Charles Haas from Drexel University. Professor Haas will be presenting on the use of epidemiologic information to set the accretional water criteria for microorganisms. But before I give the floor to Professor Haas, I would like to give you a very brief overview of what the Epidemiology Committee has been working on recently. This will be very quick, so if you would like more detail, please just contact me and uh, I would be happy to uh, provide you with more information. So for, for those of you who are not familiar, the com familiar with the committee, uh, the mission of the committee is to foster and improve the use of epidemiologic data in human health risk assessment. To give you just a few highlights, uh, in the past year, we disseminated, disseminated a survey to risk assessors to try and better understand what they need from epidemiologists to better do their job as risk assessors. We also try to kind of get um, a hold on uh, what value risk assessors grant to epidemiology and also what they think the potential for epidemiology data may be for risk assessment. So we gleaned 75 responses from risk assessors all over the world, and those were quite interesting. So we decided to uh, kind of analyze them in detail and compile what we some interesting results in a paper which will be published in the next month or so. Now, very recently, that's something that we're just starting. Uh, we decided to focus on risk of bias evaluation as well as quantitative bias analysis. So we plan on developing a couple of case studies to illustrate how quantitative bias analysis can be used and and how to proceed with quantitative bias analysis. So if you think that you might be interested in this topic, or if you would like to learn about quantitative bias analysis, just get in touch with me. Ultimately, we would like to turn these case studies into training material and workshop material. And last but not least, I have to mention our web platform, APFORA, so Epidemiology for Risk Assessment. And uh, if you look onto the platform, you see that um, what we put on the platform is material that is pertinent to risk assessment and epidemiology. And uh, more importantly, there's a link to our AP4 database. So that database is a database of basically people who have an interest in that field. So epidemiology and risk assessment. That means, uh, of course, risk assessors and epidemiologists, but also toxicologists, exposure scientists, statisticians, and the reason why we created this platform was to create a community of practice among people who have an interest in the field. Uh, we heard in the past in focus groups that we organized with this committee that there was a desire for people to try and collaborate and they transcend disciplinary silos. So we created that database. And of course, I mean, the success of the database will depend on how, on how many people create a profile in that. I would encourage everyone to um, go visit the database and create a profile. And uh, hopefully in the future, the more we grow this database, uh, the more we'll be able to kind of unite this community of practice and, and help people work together. That's all I want to say right now about uh, the work of the committee. But again, I would be happy to answer any questions. So feel free to get in touch with me. Now, before we start the presentation, a quick disclaimer to tell you that the views expressed by the speakers are the views of the speaker only and do not necessarily reflect the views of HESI or HESI members. You should know that this webinar is being recorded and uh, the recording will be posted on our committee page in a few days. If you would like to ask questions, you can ask questions throughout the presentation. You can type your questions in the question box in your control panel. So make sure that you type them in the question box and not the chat box. And the questions will be read by our co-chairs at the end of the presentation. Now, if you would like to, again, get in touch because you have questions, 
but you're curious about the project, if you would like to be a speaker in our webinar series, or if you'd like to propose speakers, just email me. And uh, for information about future webinars, we usually uh, post on our committee page, we post on social media, and you can also have some news in the, in the HESI newsletter. So with that, I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Igor Borstin, who is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, it's it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Charles Haas uh, to our webinar series. Uh, Dr. Haas is a LD Betts uh, professor of environmental engineering at Drexel University, where he has been since 1991. He received the Bachelor of Science in Biology and Master of Science in Environmental Engineering and completed his education with a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Professor Husk has co-directed the US EPA DHS University Cooperative Center of Excellence uh, for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment. He is a fellow member of many scholarly bodies, but I would like to highlight that in, in 2021, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Over his career, Professor Husk has specialized in assessment of risk from and control of human exposure to pathogenic organisms. And he'll talk about some aspects of uh, his work today, which uh, in our view has great relevance for chemical risk assessment, which is what many people in this audience are particularly concerned. Um, uh, Professor Haas serves on numerous panels of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, as well as the US EPA Board of Scientific Counselors. He fulfilled those roles in the past, and I'm sure that he will continue to provide valuable input for many years to come. And now with this short introduction, I'd like to hand over the podium to Professor Charles Haas. Thank you, Igor. and. Um... Thank you to you and to Hesse for the invitation. What I'm going to talk to you about is how epidemiology has been involved in setting uh, recreational water criteria for infectious microorganisms. So I'll start out by giving a background on recreational waterborne disease and indicators. And the use of epidemiology has gone through uh, several phases, which I've captioned generation one, generation two, generation three. And then I will finish up with uh, some of my observations on limitations that are remaining and quantitative microbial risk assessment as a complementary tool that could help work with epidemiology to help reduce uh, waterborne disease from recreational exposures. So, First of all, background in terms of diseases and indicators. <clears throat> we distinguish the types of recreational exposure into primary contact, secondary contact, and incidental. Primary contact, the canonical activity is swimming, but really any activity that involves um, total or partial head immersion, which could include gets, jet skiing and kayaking, which at least under EPA terminology, you're also considered as primary contact. Secondary contact is less intensive exposure to a surface water, canoeing, wading, uh, splashing, water park activity, and incidental contact could be fishing, could be playing in a beach sand, or those sorts of activities. The fundamental question is, what is the relationship between water quality <clears throat> when recreation occurs and risks from microbial exposure given the type of contact that the recreator engages in? Now, a brief parenthetical uh, set of comments. We've actually had criteria for sanitation or protection against waterborne disease even before we understood uh, the germ theory of disease. And this is one of my absolute favorite quotes from 1832. Uh, Chester Averill, who was a, a polymath uh, professor at Union College in upstate New York, writing to the mayor of Schenectady during what was probably a cholera outbreak at the time, 
uh, said when it is desirable to destroy the effluvia from drains, etc., or to purify water of a cistern, dissolve eight ounces of chloride of lime into a pailful of water. He was doing that using what was then accepted as being the miasmatic theory of disease. But actually, if you make some assumptions and do dose calculations, he was probably spot on in terms of the level of dose that you would need to decontaminate uh, raw sewage from infectious microorganisms. So we can often do the right thing even if we don't understand or have the wrong understanding for the reason as to why we do it. We now know, of course, that there are a multitude of diseases that have been long, long associated with water. Um, typhoid in North America dates uh, by some historians at least to the 16th century is perhaps one of the reasons for the demise of the Roanoke colony, uh, the early settlements in Virginia. Cholera was recognized as early as the early 19th century. Of course, this audience, I'm sure, knows about Jon Snow and his connection between water and health. I think uh, many epidem epidemiologists regard Jon Snow as being one of the early geographic epidemiologists. I regard Jon Snow as being one of the early sanitary engineers because not only did he um, map the connection between disease and um, uh, geography, but he also took action by removing the pump handle from the well. In the 20th and 21st century, we now know that there is a spectrum of viruses, other bacteria, protozoa, including non-gastroenteric organisms that can be transmitted via waterborne exposure. It was and it is impossible to measure them all. And so we need to do something other than measuring them all to gauge what the risk might be from exposure to a water with contamination in it. And one solution that has long been used is the use of an indicator. We use a, a microorganism typically that is not necessarily pathogenic as an indicator for the pathogen potential of a contaminated water that could cause disease. Now, indicator tends to be used in three contexts, at least in environmental engineering, we can use it as an index of absolute quality or suitability of a water as a recreational supply or water supply. We can use it as an indicator of treatment efficiency to what degree have our treatment processes reduced the risks associated with exposure to that water. Or we can use it, and this is my use in this talk, as an indicator of human health risk to provide a direct correlate from which we can estimate risk associated with the given exposure, in this case, via recreation. Now, we've long used coliforms as an indicator. And I'll introduce three terms here, which I'll define uh, more in a moment. Total coliform, which is the outer circle, fecal coliform, and E. coli. And if the world was ideal, we would regard fecal coliform as being an absolute subset of total coliform and E. coli being an absolute subset of fecal coliform. Unfortunately, for a variety of analytical reasons, it gets messier than that. Um, I won't have time to get into all the issues and distinctions, but recognize that although we do treat these as being subsets, the circles do, in fact, um, have points of non-intersection and non-overlap. Now, total coliform as a concept uh, appears to have been first used as a term at the dawn of the 20th century by Horrocks, who coined the term coliform uh, based on a particular bacteriological assay uh, that defined the group. However, even he and then others recognized that not all coliform came from a human waste, that there were other sources of organisms that responded as positive to the coliform assay that were not necessarily associated 
with human contamination. Somewhat later on, for the coliform group, the term total coliform was adopted, or sometimes coli, coliorogenes group adopted as the term for the uh, what Horrocks called coliform to distinguish it from subsets in that Venn diagram I presented in the previous slide. Now, and we realize that, as I said, coliform can arise from sources other than human fecal matter. Uh, and presumably, although we now know it's not true, human fecal matter was the primary um, rationale for control of water pollution with the feeling that the problematic human infectious diseases resulted from contamination with human fecal material. We also recognize that coliform, especially in warm, moist environments, could regrow and increase in number and persist in those environments for long periods of time, possibly even after the pathogens themselves have decayed. And so there were a number of investigators starting as early as the late 50s and going on to the 60s and 70s that tried to work on modifications to the total coliform ESA. Uh, Kabler et al. has some of the early history on this. Uh, there were people who looked at biochemical ESAs, some with a, a more classical microbiological training might remember a group of biochemical tests called the IMVIC tests that differentiated amongst the coliform group. Um, Eichmann in 1904 realized that by incubating coliform, not at 37 degrees, but at elevated temperature, typically 44 degrees Celsius is used, you could get a more differential response the organism is more likely to come from fecal material warm-blooded uh, mammals. And so ultimately, uh, Geldrich at EPA, well, first at the Public Health Service, and then the EPA, developed the fecal coliform concept into both the most probable number or multiple two BSA, and then ultimately the membrane filter fecal coliform test that gets used today. And, but even with the fecal coliform test, we realized that some thermotolerant coliform can still come from non-human sources. This may not be so bad because we know that non-human sources, animals, can uh, be the source of many pathogens that are of human concern. Thermotolerant coliform may decay in the environment more rapidly than pathogens, especially non-bacterial pathogens, specifically virus and protozoa, leading to false negatives. And so even fecal coliform are imperfect indicators. We know that during the course of environmental exposure and especially during a wastewater treatment, some bacteria can become injured, but still remain in principle infectious these are termed non-viable, uh, viable but non-culturable organisms that still can be a health concern, but are not enumerated on classical bacteriological medium. And to complicate matters even further, there are some E. coli, notably E. coli 015787, that's become a predominant human pathogen, that are not enumerated either on fecal coliform media or in fact on media that's designed to be specific to E. coli. So again, we have a false negative. The bottom line is we really don't have a good sense, although coliform and fecal coliform and E. coli have been used in one form or another for only over 100 years, we don't really have a true sense of false positive and false negative rates in environmental samples. Uh, broadly distributed. Now, some authors have tried to get around these limitations of coliform by saying, well, let, let's not look at one indicator, let's look at and multiple indicators. 
again, going back to Ed Geldrich, who um, was one of the senior microbiologists at, UP, at EPA and earlier at the Public Health Service, um, realized that if you look at animal waste and human waste, <clears throat> although animals may excrete coliform and fecal coliform, they also excrete fecal streptococci. In human waste, there are a much greater number of fecal coliform excreted relative to fecal streptococci, whereas animals, the reverse is true. And so one possibility that Geldrich and colleagues came up with is looking at the ratio of two indicators, fecal coliform to fecal strep, as a way to differentiate between potential sources of solution of pollution. Classically, if the fecal coliform to fecal strep ratio is 4.0 or above, we say that we have a human dominated source of pollution. If the fecal coliform to fecal strep ratio is below one, we say it's a non human dominated source of pollution. And then in the intermediate range, presumably it's a mixture. Now, in reality, uh, the use of those ratios has been and is being supplanted by the use of sp specific molecular biological uh, markers for various substrains of bacteria. I want to switch now to how we've incorporated uh, indicator concepts with epidemiology to develop useful tools to estimate risk. The very first epidemiological studies that I'm aware of occurred in the 1950s. And they started from a series of simple-minded questions. Can we associate the level of any indicator organism with the rate of disease occurrence in recreators under certain conditions? To do this, <clears throat> there are certain basic assumptions that need to be made. Now, two of these are common to most environmental epidemiological investigations, the second and third bullets, that is the study population that we look at representative of the overall population to which we want to make inference to. And then have we eliminated or controlled for sources of confounding, used appropriate controls, or eliminated bias, et cetera? The first bullet is somewhat unique. And we need to recognize when we use indicators in a recreational epidemiological study, we're implying if we attempt to generalize this to other settings, that there's a consistency in the relative occurrence of the indicators to the spectrum of actual pathogens that may cause exposure in different bodies of water. Having said, Stevenson in a 1953 paper published um, the first really modern epidemiological study is based on bather investigations in Lake Michigan and Chicago, uh, the Ohio River at Dayton and Long Island Sound in New York recognized that the Lake Michigan and the Ohio River studies are freshwater, Long Island Sound is saline water. And they noted a clear difference in illness rate in bathers compared to non-bathing populations when the total coliform were above about 2,300 to 2,700 organisms per 100 ml. The other interesting thing about the Stevenson study, which not a lot of subsequent investigators have um, keyed in on, but I think again is well known to the epidemiological community who speak of a, of a healthy worker effect in occupational epidemiology. There's a healthy swimmer effect, which was Stevenson's terminology, I believe, in which those who swim at the highest frequency in his study appeared to have lower rates of adverse illness than those who swum at an intermediate or a low rate, um, possibly indicating bias in the population because uh, swimming behavior was self-selected 
or perhaps the onset of immunity due to a large number of exposures over time. Limitations in Stevenson's study, he really didn't do a systematic and deliberate incorporation of non-swimming controls. There was voluntary uh, behavior of swimming versus non-swimming. There wasn't a precise definition of what swimming meant. Um, illnesses were imprecisely defined and self-recorded. The only indicators that were used were total coliform and the dominant source of contamination in the waters that were studied were primarily untreated sewage effluent. Uh, 19, early 1950s, late 1940s was really well before the era of modern sewage treatment. So we move on from the Stevenson studies to what I've captioned here, generation two epidemiology, which occurred um, in the US, Canada, Europe, Asia, Australia, there have been several studies. In the US, uh, Victor Cabelli and Al Dufour um, were the dominant authors. And interestingly enough, and to any EPA folks on the line who may um, recognize the name of Al Dufour, I believe Al Dufour is currently probably the most senior employee at EPA still with the agency. He, um, was there at the outset and is an old public health service guy. Um, but they, the design of these studies was they generally did incorporate deliberate non-swimming controls, although swimming versus non-swimming behavior was voluntary. They came up with a precise case definition, which I haven't um, replicated on the slide, but they defined what they called highly credible gastroenteritis as a tightly defined outcome. That's the primary focus of their epi study. They related excess effects in the swimming group uh, versus the control group to water quality during exposure. They often looked at multiple indicators. They designed the study so they were prospective in nature. They recruited uh, bathers and non-bathers at the beach by interview. And their general findings were that enterococcus or in freshwater E. coli were often superior to fecal coliform or total coliform relating to excess health effects. And they were able to develop dose response relationships between the level of indicator at the time of exposure and the odds of, um, or the rate of excess illness in swimmers versus non-swimmers. And ultimately these and the generation two studies that I'll describe in a moment have been used as a basis for the US guidelines for primary contact recreational exposure. As an example of the findings that they came up with, this is from, um, uh, one of Cabelli and DeFore's early studies, where uh, this involves the New York City uh, Lake Pontchartrain and Boston Harbor studies, all of which are um, saltwater exposures, looking at the relationship between enterococcus and excess swimming exposure, gastrointestinal symptom rate on the left, or E. coli on the right. The difference in the two sets of lines represents the difference between overall gastroenteritis symptoms and highly credible gastroenteritis symptoms with the highly credible symptoms tending to give a somewhat tighter uh, fit. And based on this, there's a clear dose response trend, which was statistically significant. They did similar types of investigations in a number of freshwater beaches and came up with levels of enterococci or E. coli that would correspond to an excess level of risk that were consistent ultimately with Stevenson's findings from his 1953 bathing beat study. Now there are still some 
uh, issues with the design of Cabelli and DeFore study, which I think um, Al DeFore would, would agree with. The swimmers and non-swimmers were self-selected, and so there's potential confounding as to why individuals decided to swim versus not swim on a particular day. And by swimming, by the way, swimming was tightly defined in the Cabelli et al. study as immersing of the head completely underwater. So at least there is a consistent definition of swimming. And based on the study, the risks at barely acceptable beaches were computed and used to set bacteria water quality standards. The focus though was still on settings with the major influence from sewage. In this case, in the 1960s and early 70s, there was at least what we now regard as secondary treated effluent being discharged to those receiving water. So it's no longer raw sewage, but secondary treated sewage. We go into third generation studies and principally now, um, I want to talk about a couple of meta-analyses that were done tying a broad set of further studies together. This was a very thorough paper in uh, 2020 by uh, Russo et al, uh, folks from EPA, including Al DeFour on this paper. Uh, Sharon Napier uh, is one of the uh, mid-level EPA investigators on the study. Sharon actually spent a year with me at Drexel on a postdoc. Um, and Tim Wade is one of the key epidemiologists um, who's worked for the last couple uh, decades as follow through to Cabelli and DeFore on these studies. This meta-analysis looked at multiple outcomes, looked at not just swimming, but other types of recreational exposures. And I want to give you a high-level overview of some of Rousseau et al's findings, because there are some interesting tantalizing tidbits to what they found. So by synthesizing a number of the epidemiological studies that have been done, First of all, the key thing that emerges, and this is a typical meta-analysis plot with um, odds ratio at the bottom, many of you may be familiar with interpreting these, clearly swimming emerges as being a major positive associated impact, whether it's general gastroenteritis, highly credible gastroenteritis, diarrhea, or all outcomes. There's some evidence that other sports-related activity, which could include activities such as surfing, diving, water skiing, uh, boating, canoeing, etc., could have positive um, adverse health effects as well. Limited and um, inconclusive evidence with respect to exposure to sand and limited and inconclusive evidence with respect to just minimal exposure, just being present at a beach or a bathing site. And so nothing surprising there from gastroenteric uh, outcomes. What's interesting to me, and I think really is well-deserving of more follow-up, is the Russo et al. study looked also at respiratory infections and respiratory outcomes, as well as skin outcomes. And I haven't pulled out their meta-analysis diagram for skin outcomes here, but they show some positive uh, relationships or certain types of skin outcomes as well. For respiratory, um, they show a clear evidence of general respiratory infection outcome associated with swimming and sports-related exposures. Um, SRD is um, a symptomatic respiratory disease, mixed message on that. But the general respiratory infection one is intriguing to me, and I don't think we have a good handle on what the etiological agents are or what the vehicles of exposure are that could be associated with those respiratory outcomes. Um, a few things crossed my mind, and it's something that I've been engaged in looking at, we know that uh, you can get aerosolization of water 
in aquatic environments, and so there could be airborne exposure to various waterborne pathogens. And we also know that fungi, which can be respiratory pathogens, can occur in polluted waters. And I've got a PhD student now looking at doing fungal risk assessment in various aquatic environments, um, trying to follow up on, on that as an issue. But it's worthy of a lot deeper dive by other investigators. The summation of the Russo paper is the intensity of activity um, influences the risk, presumably because the duration and the amount of exposure in terms of the effective amount of polluted water that one ingests or inhales um, serves as the dosage to um, cause the risk to occur. Non-gastroenteritis outcomes are also significant outcomes for recreational exposure. And it's not clear that the current use of coliform or enterococcus indicators may be protective against these outcomes. And as I said, this is something deserving of future work. Now, Wade and other colleagues have gone on to look at whether or not uh, the replacement of culture mechanisms for indicators by molecular methods can be useful. We know that molecular biology is rapidly um, supplementing and supplanting classical cultural methodology in environmental micro. And so Wade has used epidemiological approaches to correlate excess risk with qPCR uh, uh, enterococcus as his independent variable, and it correlates nicely in this case with the additional probability of gastroenteric illness for the Lake Michigan and Lake Erie bathing beat studies from the 2006 paper in EHP. So we are at a point where we can start to use qPCR, which is a much more interesting and potentially much more rapid technique that can be used to monitor recreational water quality. Now, there are still limitations that remain, and here's where I think microbial risk assessment can serve as a complementary technique. First of all, we know that <clears throat> despite the implementation of recreational water quality guidelines, we still have outbreaks that exist. This is the most recent tabulation by EPA, which is um, obviously well behind the times. 2000 to 2014 was published in 2018. I believe there's not been anything more recent due to uh, CDC's efforts going to COVID. But even with this supplement, they reported on average about 14 outbreaks, 10 to 14 outbreaks per year. Uh, from all causes due to recreational waterborne outbreaks. This is untreated, so it excludes swimming pools, water parks, and other engineered recreational waterborne exposures. But even having said that, we know that in general, outbreak waterborne diseases uh, reported by CDC only cover the tip of the iceberg. And the underreporting is unclear, but wouldn't surprise me if this is probably short by a factor of 100. So we have a significant number of recreational water outbreaks and recreational water cases that go underreported. What are the recreational waterborne illnesses due to? So, Soller and Bartrian, Ashbolt, Ravenscroft, and Wade had a paper in 2010. Um, Ravenscroft and Wade uh, are with EPA. Nick Ashbolt was with EPA. Tim Bartrian is a former PhD student of mine who's now an independent consultant. And Jeff Soller is an independent consultant in California. What they did is they looked at um, the Great Lakes epidemiological studies that were done and they tried to see whether or not the findings could be explained by 
what was known from the characteristics of a couple of waterborne pathogens that could have been the putative agents of infectious disease. Norovirus, rotavirus, adenocryptosporidium, uh, giardia, campylobacter, salmonella, et cetera. And bottom line is, it appears that at least during those 2003, 2004 epidemiological studies, the dominant adverse outcomes were due to norovirus based on um, characteristics of the illness. But this may not necessarily be a universal truth, and it may be that in other circumstances for other types of contamination, pathogens other than norovirus could be the ones of significance. How about non-human contaminated waters? Again, a similar group of investigators looked at a situation in Georgia where the dominant source of contamination was from various agricultural and wastes. And in this particular case, they had bodies of water that were that appeared to be dominated by bovine sources of microbial contamination. They looked at <clears throat> cattle, pigs, chicken, etc. We have a broad distribution of potential pathogens that could be in a watershed and could be sources of contamination. What is EPA's perspective at this point? Well, there are no national standards for recreational water quality. Indeed, there's no national requirement for treating wastewater to achieve microbial quality of any impacted water. Rather, the requirement is that each state has to determine what the best available uses are of an individual receiving water and then develop water quality criteria using EPA guidance to meet those use attainment goals for the watershed. And then based on those recreational water quality criteria go back and set discharge requirements for a particular point source to discharge the pollution. EPA's water quality criteria uh, were set in 2012 and remain in effect. They're based on for a marine and freshwater either in terracoxi or for freshwater E. coli using geometric mean of a consecutive 30-day period or not to exceed values in any seven-day period, which are designed to be a 90th percentile value based on the epidemiological study. And as the word had said, these are recommendations intended as guidelines. As guidelines, they're non-enforceable, um, although I think typically most states have adopted these. A few states may be somewhat more stringent. And the spectrum in terms of state setting mandated treatment of point source discharges is quite a mixed picture going from state to state. So the open questions that arise is, we still don't have a good understanding of how to respond when the dominant pollution is non-sewage, when sources other than point source dis discharges of wastewater are the driving forces of contamination to a watershed. Animals, stormwater, other bathers, non-point runoff, Etc. And this is increasingly a source of limitation of use, particularly of urban watersheds for recreation. We're seeing right here in Philadelphia a big controversy at the moment with a lot of the citizenry trying to drive the lower reaches of the Delaware 
toward uh, a swimming use attainability, which will require substantial uh, resource investment, both for point and non-point source pollution control in all the municipalities that drain into the Delaware River. We don't really have an understanding of how to guard against non-gastroenteric endpoints uh, based on the particular intriguing findings from Russo. We need to understand how to control adverse respiratory, dermal, ocular, and oral impacts that may result from recreational water exposure. What do we do about non-swimming exposures? Sands, soils, inhalation of aerosols. I didn't, didn't mention it, but actually, if you go back to the Cabelli and DeFore study, even in the Cabelli and DeFore study, they did mention, uh, they did measure um, illness rates in non-bathers. And people who were non-bathing but attend, but were at the beach did appear to have somewhat elevated levels of some symptoms compared to the general population. So even exposure in the proximity of the water, maybe due to aerosols, maybe due to other factors, could be an exposure that we need to understand better. And finally, how best do we treat non-primary exposures? EPA's guidelines are for primary recreational exposure. What do we do for secondary or incidental exposure? I'll give you an example, and I had a student look at incidental and secondary exposures in the Delaware River scenario. People who fish from a polluted body of water, they catch their fish, and very often they clean their fish at or near the shoreline. Well, are they always washing their hands after they touch the fish and clean it? No. And there could be hand-to-mouth contact and incidental exposure there. How do we describe that and how do we describe the risk and how do we set quality standards with that level of exposure? So with that, uh, I think I have time for a number of questions. Many former students and colleagues, I mentioned some of them, Tim Bartry and uh, Chris Crockett, a former PhD student of mine who's now with Aqua America, Neha Sunger, uh, Michael Ryan, and then two longtime collaborators, Joan Rose at Michigan State and Chuck Erb at University of Arizona. So with that, I think I can stop, stop sharing my screen and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Haas, for an excellent presentation. Um, so for the audience, you can type your questions in the question box, if you have any. So far, I'm not seeing... I'll, 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 I'll lead with a question. Uh, so so while well, well, folks are gathering their thoughts, again, thank you very much for the presentation and overview of the topic. I especially, especially appreciate uh, a historical perspective on how things evolved in the water world and where they still uh, need to go. Um, can you please talk a little bit about sort of impetuses for doing this? I often find various areas of uh, environmental occupational epidemiology, the various actors who are pushing for new insights and assessments, and that largely determines what sort of work is done. Uh, we rarely address this, uh, you know, among my colleagues, but I was wondering whether you could offer some thoughts as to who was pushing for these guidelines, for these studies, and how did that shape the type of evidence, the type of uh, challenges that arise? Well, so I mean, I'll, I'll give you the impetus for the Cabelli and DeFore studies. So and now I'll, I'll delve more into more into history. So when the um, and when the Clean Water Act was was promulgated, the um, the mandate was that all discharges to navigable water waters of the U.S. would achieve secondary treatment, and EPA was tasked with defining secondary treatment. And the earliest definition of secondary treatment under the Clean Water Act was uh, removal of BOD and suspended solids 
and achieving an objective with respect to coliform. So in fact, there was a period of time from about 1972 to 1976 where the definition of secondary treatment included a coliform standard. And the Cavelli and DeFore studies were really instrumental behind developing and supporting that early fecal coliform standard, which was a point, uh, which was a uh, discharge permit standard of 200 fecal coliform per 100 ml. Now, <clears throat> for a whole variety of reasons, in about 1976 to 1978, uh, coliform were removed from the federal definition of secondary treatment, which is uh, when the mandate for disinfection was dropped from wastewater treatment. Um, currently at this point, I think there's been an increasing driver recognizing that we have a growing number of susceptible subpopulations that would still like to benefit from recreation. And particularly over the last four years, there's been a number of, in my mind, the mis misguided, but nonetheless concerns for whether or not a COVID could be transmitted by recreational exposure. I think that particular exposure is a non-issue, but it certainly um, heightened attention to recreational exposure to pathogens um, via swimming. Okay, thank you. Are there similar concerns about green water infrastructure? I know that you know, we meddled a little bit in, in, that, in that realm. Uh, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. David, you're muted. Yeah, I don't see any chest questions in the chat, so I'll, uh, or the question box, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, perhaps incorrectly, I, I think of uh, Legionella mostly as the built environment and HVAC and probably extended back to the Bellevue Stratford. Stratford Hotel incident in uh, 1976 or so, uh, and, and that showing up there. Uh, is Legionella a problem, basically, in terms of recreational waters? Uh, so uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I don't think we know. Uh, you know, one of the intriguing things is that, um, you know, Legionella, and I've done a lot of work in Legionella specifically, uh, you know, about 30 or 40 percent of the cases of Legionella have not yet been associated with a particular point source of exposure. And they're just generally referred to as community acquired cases. And so we don't really know where those community acquired cases might come from. Uh, they could from, come from uh, you know, aerosolization from uh, uh, water bodies and inadvertent exposure. They could come from uh, dust borne exposure. It's not just Legionella, there are other organisms that can be transmitted via a similar route. I've done a lot of work over the years with um, mycobacteria, and atypical mycobacterioses can be transmitted as well. And there's a growing number of, um, a growing amount of disease burden of the atypical mycobacterioses in the population as well. So I don't think we have a handle on what the sources of these different respiratory pathogens could be. Certainly the built environment is important, but there's other stuff out there. Uh, there there's a very sort of geeky technical question that I think has been of great concern to, to our environmental uh, epidemiology risk assessment committee, and that is, how people go about defining these thresholds, uh, which uh, we need to consider. I mean, I think there is a great deal of uh, uh, disgruntlement with how epidemiologists typically go about it. Uh, I would like to hear your take on the issue and about what is done well, what is done poorly, and how can we do better? Are you asking me what level of risk is acceptable, Igor? Yes, yes. Where would we draw the line? Yeah, so you know, my uh, you know, so I spend most of my time in the risk analysis world, and <clears throat> we want to make a firm distinction between risk assessment and 
risk management. And, you know, what I would say is defining what is acceptable is not purely a technical consideration, but involves a whole spectrum of other issues and economics and social policy and um, perception and risk amplification need to be factored into that decision as well. So I would, you know, I would say that the risk assessors bring valuable data to the table, but it also needs to be tempered in what people have called an analytical deliberative process involving all these other factors being balanced. And the balancing point is going to be quite problem specific. Just as a, as a follow up to that, I think one of your earlier slides talked about the limit, and I think that used the term uh, barely acceptable or something like that. Uh, well, so barely, barely acceptable in that context. So, you know, if so, I mean, I'll give you more history. So, if you start with Stevenson's number of twenty three hundred to twenty seven hundred <clears throat> total coliform, and then. Over the years, when we went to fecal coliform, the ratio in wastewater was thought to be about five to one, six to one. So if you divide Stevenson's number by six to one, you get to, let's say, 400 fecal coliform. And then if, if you now throw in a factor of safety of two, that gives you 200 fecal coliform, which is ultimately where that effluent standard of 200 fecal coliform that was used in the original uh, Clean Water Act implementation came from. And so when I talked about barely acceptable in the context of the Cabelli DeFore study, that was in bathing beaches that were barely meeting that level of 200 fecal coliform from permitted wastewater discharges at the time when secondary treatment, including disinfection, was required. So it's barely acceptable in a permit point of view, not from an acceptable risk point of view. Now, I'll, I'll, let me just carry that further. So if you go to the 2012 guidelines, which I put up, they did have an acceptable risk number in there. And where that number comes from is based on the epidemiology that was done in those bathing beaches that were barely acceptable they back calculated the risk to be 30 some odd per thousand bathing uh, instances at a time. And so that was regarded as being the risk that was accepted associated with that 200 fecal coliform standard. So we've sort of built up a house of cards, but there's never really been an EPA over the years has shied away from explicitly stating that this level of risk for recreational exposure should be acceptable. They've used a risk that was accepted as being the regulatory bright line. Yeah. I mean, the, I have a comment and a question. I mean, I'm curious about Sort of potential impacts of regulating various exposures in the environment. There's, there's, you know, as David knows, there's enormous effort gone into control of agrochemicals, enormous amount of attention to air pollution, uh, which are tightly regulated. And I just uh, would like to have these various risks, including waterborne microbes, compete with each other to see what is the actual, where, when can the greatest benefit be achieved? I mean, I, you know, I have no problem with. I, I absolutely agree with you, Igor. And you know, in in a lot of contexts, I've been making the argument for a long period of time that, and we really should be moving toward use of qualies or dollies as an integrated measure of adverse outcome. And in fact, at WHO in their recreational water criteria, and the drinking water criteria for that matter, have gone to the use of a quali or dolly approach in terms of guideline setting the australians have gone that route gone that that road i think we really need to figure out how we get to that point here in the us and i don't know how we do it 
Yeah, I think we do it by trying. I have a friend of mine in UK who was trying to do it in a more sophisticated way rather than just a point estimate. It's just, it's a question of you know, capturing imagination of regulators, the client here, and perhaps, I don't know. Yeah, and, and there, I mean, there are also philosophical problems, which, you know, I don't think I have the time to get into, but, you know, qualities and dollies themselves are also imperfect, but they're they're certainly better than simply a crude me measure of, um, of illness. Yeah, yeah, I entirely agree. All right. We do have uh, a question from the audience, maybe if we have, well, it's too long, but maybe just, you know, for one more minute. If you have any thoughts on sure. the risk, any thoughts on the risk of cryptosporidium risk uh, from uh, drinking water? And uh, what's the latest on acceptable risk management limits versus water board advisories? Oh boy, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah that 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 could be a, another long seminar. Um, you know, certainly crypto is is still a significant risk. I think um, you know there are some loopholes that we need to worry about. There are still some utilities that are not required to treat and to disinfect, uh, and that are moving toward treatment and disinfection. I'm particularly concerned about vulnerable groundwater supplies and um, water supplies that are called groundwater under the influence, which is a big um, big loophole in terms of uh, regulating drinking water quality in the US. Um, it's, it's a balancing act between the risk of um, infectious disease and the risk of disinfection byproducts. And we've done some work on that here. Boil water advisories have their own problems. As many people know, the moment you implement the boil water advisory, you have risks associated uh, with scalding and um, uh, you know that sort of thing. And so, you know, where you set the balancing between those two is another issue that is worth some analytical attention. Um, you know, but the point is we haven't solved the infectious disease problem in the U.S. by recreational water, by drinking water, by exposure to sludges, by exposure to aerosols. Yeah. Good okay. ending point. All right. Okay. <laughs> Still work to do. All right. Yeah, well, Absolutely. thank you so much, uh, Professor Haas, for your time for an excellent presentation and taking the time to uh, answer some questions. I want also to uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, so once again, the recording will be available in a few days on our committee webpage. If you have questions, feedback, you would like to present in this webinar series or propose some speakers, just send me an email. I'd be happy to, uh, to get in touch or to talk to you. With that, we're going to adjourn. So, and also thank you, Igor, David, for the questions and uh, everybody you have a good day and stay tuned for our next webinar thank you bye-bye goodbye